Okay, so um, in this question, we've got a unit conversion question and it says is the, the sun is a sphere with an estimated mass of two by 10 to the 30 kilograms. If the radius of the sun is seven by 10 to the five kilometers, what is the average density of the sun in units of grams per millimeter cubed? And then it gives the formula for the volume of the sphere. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my kilograms into grams. So 2.0 and by 10 to the 30 kilograms times 10 to the three grams per one kilogram. And that'll do that for me. So that's gonna end up being 2.0 by 10 to the 33 grams. So I've got half of my um, problem resolved and now I just have to do the uh, volume calculation expressing that volume in millimeters cubed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the radius into um, millimeters before I get going. So I've got 7.0 by 10 to the 5 kilometers times 10 to the 3 meters per one kilometer times one millimeter for every 10 to the minus three meters. Put that into my calculator and I get seven by 10 to the five times one by 10 to the three times one on one by 10 to the minus three, seven by 10 to the 11 millimeters. Okay. So now I'm ready to calculate a volume and the volume is four thirds pi r cubed. So for volume, four thirds pi seven by 10 to the 11 millimeters all cubed. So I can put that into my calculator. And I've got an answer of 1.44 by 10 to the 36. 1.44 by 10 to the 36 millimeters cubed. Okay, so now I just want to do my um, density. I've got my grams and I've got my volume in millimeters cubed. So my density is my mass on my volume. So two point zero by 10 to the 33 grams for every 1.44 by 10 to the 36, 36 millimeters cubed. Okay, and I'm not gonna round off until the very end, but let's just put that into my calculator. And I end up with an answer, 1.4. By 10 to the minus 3 grams per millimeter cubed. And there we are. Okay, so when I look back up here, what are my sig figs? Why did I round it off there? Two sig figs there, two sig figs there. So I gave my answer at the very end there, two sig figs. So that looks good. Okay, so this quiz question reads, indicate whether the following describe intensive or extensive properties. So intensive do not depend on the amount of substance and extensive do. Density doesn't change with amount, so it is intensive. The substance conducts electricity. Electrical conductivity does not change with amount, so that is also intensive. 
the substance has a water solubility of 0.379 grams in 10 mils. Now, this kind of sounds like it could depend on the amount, but it doesn't. You will only ever be able to dissolve a maximum of 0.379 grams of this particular substance in 10 mils. It doesn't matter um, how much more of it you have, you'll only ever get 0.379 grams to dissolve. So this property is in fact intensive. And then the substance sublimes at a temperature of minus 42 degrees Celsius. The temperature of um, phase changes is independent of amounts. And um, an ice cube, for example, regardless of how big it is, will always melt at zero degrees Celsius. So this is also intensive. So this question is similar to the previous one. It says, identify if each of the following st statements describe a chemical or physical property. So physical properties do not involve changing um, the composition, chemical properties do. So formaldehyde is flammable, that is a chemical property because you would be changing the, flam and the formaldehyde into other things when you burnt it. Copper metal melts at 1085 degrees Celsius. This is a physical property the melting of a substance doesn't change its composition, it just turns it into a liquid. Helium gas is less dense than an air. So this is a property that we can determine without attempting to change the helium gas into anything else. So that characterizes it as a physical property. And then it says water reacts with iron, iron metal and oxygen to form rust. We're talking about a chemical reaction and we're creating new substances, rust. So therefore, this is a chemical property. So a third question that's on a similar theme. This one says, identify if each of the following statements describe a chemical or physical change. So chemical changes result in the formation of new substances. Physical changes don't. Dry ice subliming is a physical change. Phase changes like subliming are always physical. They don't result in the production of new substances. Dynamite exploding. So explosion is an example of decomposition, one um, compound falling apart and forming multiple um, products. So this is a chemical reaction because new substances will be formed. Bleaching your hair, in this case, we're taking the darker pigments and chemically transforming them and turning them into lighter pigments. So we are creating new substances. So this is a chemical change. And then alcohol evaporating. This is another example of a phase change going from liquid to gas this time. And, and phase changes are physical changes. We don't actually change the composition of our sample when we do that. Okay, so in this question, it asks you to fill in the missing word in the following statement. The statement reads, if you can easily see the different parts that make up a mixture, you know that it is a blank mixture. So the thing here is, is that you can visibly detect different bits to it. And that's an example of what we call a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, so in question six, we're being asked to perform um, two calculations. And then it says, give your answers in both standard and scientific notation. So we have to be a little bit careful to make sure that we do both parts there and don't miss some easy points. And then it also says, assume all numbers are measurements, which means that there are no exact numbers present. So we have to remember our two rules for multiplication and division. It's all about the sig figs. And for adding and subtracting, it's all about where the uncertainty is. So in this first problem, we had both um, multiplication occurring and addition. So we're gonna be using both rules. We're gonna follow our just normal rules for order of operations and we're gonna do the parentheses first. What I'll do is I'll do that um, multiplication in there, but I won't actually round the answer. I'll just take note of where I would have rounded the answer if that was the only step that I was doing. So when I do that, I got an answer of 123.93. You can read my writing. 
And then I note here that this guy has four sig figs, this one here has four sig figs. So if I was really rounding that off, I would have rounded it off at four. If that was the only thing I was doing, I would have rounded that off at four sig figs, which is at the nine there. Okay, so now I'm gonna do my addition plus 21. And I get the calculator answer, which was 144.93. So where do I round it off? Well, when it comes time to do the addition, I have to consider my um, rule, I have to consider the uncertainties. And so this guy was plus or minus one. And at the fourth significant figure, this would have been plus or minus 0.1. So I have to round this answer off at the ones. So it looks like this is going to be 145. So I'm just gonna double check all of that. 55.08 times 2.250 gave me 123.93 plus 21 gives me 144.93. And we want to round it at the ones, so that's going to be 145. I feel good about that one. Okay, so there's one more step to do here, is I have to convert this to scientific notation. So I will do that as well. And there it is, okay. All right, so this is um, two numbers that are written in scientific notation and we're doing subtraction. So it's all about where the plus or minus is. What I find is easiest to do here is to write both the numbers out um, in regular notation so we can see where we need to cut off for significant figures. So that's gonna be 1,204 minus 865.6. And so this is plus or minus one, and this is my plus or minus 0.1. So when I give my answer, it's going to be rounded to the ones. So 1204 minus 865.6, there we go. And it says 338.4, and I have to round that to the ones. So that's just gonna be 338 for my answer in conventional notation, and then 3.38 by 10 to the two for my answer in scientific notation. So this problem um, is asking about a cheetah that's running at 65 miles per hour. So it says cheetahs can run at speeds of up to 65 miles per hour. How many seconds does it take a cheetah to run 20 meters? And it's interesting that they put a dot after that um, trailing zero there at this speed. And then it gives some information about miles and kilometers. So I want to, uh, I'm trying to solve for seconds. So let's just make that clear that that's my goal. And I'm starting with 20 meters, okay? So 20 meters, so two sig figs there um, in that number, okay? Now I've got a speed in miles per hour, so I'm gonna turn my meters into miles. So what I know is a one kilometer is the same as 10 to the three meters, and then I'm gonna use that little bit of information that they gave me, one mile, is 1.609 kilometers and it looks like I'm almost there. I'm just gonna ignore that. Okay, so at this point, I would have things in miles, but I don't want miles, I want seconds. So what I've got to do now is use my speed to get it to time. So it says it's 65 miles in one hour. And so that will get me to hours, but I'm not really, I'm not wanting hours, I'm wanting seconds. So I know that there are 60 minutes in one hour, and then there are also 60 seconds in one minute. 
So that will actually get me there. So let me see, we've got hours, hours, minutes, minutes, leaves, seconds. So I got it. Now think about this, this cheetah's running at 65 miles per hour. It's not gonna take him very, very long to run, um, to run the, the 20 meters. So let's see what we get. Into my calculator. And I'm expecting that this is going to be a number that's less than one. And I got 0.69. So that sounds good to me. 0.69. Okay. Nice work. Okay. So, um, this question asks, using the periodic table, classify each of the following elements as a metal or a non-metal, and then further classify each as a main group or tentatively representative element, transition metal or inner transition metal. So these guys are your B groups. These guys are your F block that are under the periodic table. And then your main group ones, they're your A and groups. So um, having a look at this, got to find the element in the periodic table. Uranium is a metal. And it's in the F block. So that means it's an inner transition. Okay. All right. Bromine is in group 7A. That makes it a non-metal. It's in a B group, so that makes it a main group element. All of the non-metals are in the are main group or representative elements. Okay, just down a little. Strontium is in group 2A, over on the far left of the periodic table. That makes it a metal because it's in an A group, it's also a main group or representative element. Neon is in group 8A, that makes it a non-metal. And it's in an A group, it's in group 8A as I mentioned. And so that means that it's a main group or representative element. And this question asks, write the isotope symbol, including the atomic number, which is given the symbol Z and is found in the periodic table, and the mass number. And if you remember, the mass number has the symbol A, and it's your neutrons plus your protons. The atomic number is just equal to the number of protons, but it's also equal to the number of electrons. So the first one asks about a charcogen. Charcogens are in the oxygen group. So that's group six out of the periodic table and we want the one with the mass number of 125. So the mass number always goes on top of the isotope symbol. And then now I'm gonna look in at group 6A and I see that um, tellurium has an average mass of 127. So I'm gonna put the symbol for tellurium and then um, it has atomic number according to periodic table of 52. So tellurium 125 and um, is the one that we've got there. Okay, now you could put another um, chalcogen and change the, um, the atomic number there if you wanted to. So this is the noble gas. So that means it's a group 8A element and it has 10 electrons, but that also means that it has 10 protons because the number of protons and electrons are always equal. So the mass, the atomic number is 10, and then protons plus neutrons is going to give me 20, and now I just need to find element 10 in the periodic table, which is neon. So you see the bigger of the two numbers always goes on the top. Okay. I said the alkaline metal, Alkali metals are in group 1A, so that's what I'm going to be looking And This one, it makes it real easy. It gives you the atomic number straight up. It says it's 11, and it says a mass number of 23, so 23 on top. So I just have to find element number 11, and that is sodium. 
Now for D it says the alkaline earth metal. The alkaline earths are in group 2A and it says it has 88 electrons, which also means that it has 88 protons. So the atomic number is 88 and then it's got 138 neutrons. So remembering that the mass number is the neutrons plus the protons, I'm going to have to add those two numbers together. So 88 plus 138 equals 226. So now I just have to find element 88 that is in group 2A of the periodic table, and that is radium Ra. So now we're done there. So this question asks, what were the key results from JJ Thompson's cathode ray tube experiments? And the two biggies are he discovered a negatively charged, charged subatomic particle. The second thing that he discovered was the, he determined the mass to charge ratio of this particle. So nice and simple. If you wanted to get fancy, there's a third, third thing that he proposed, but he didn't really discover from his experiments was he proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. So if you put that, then that would be kind of a little bit of a bonus.